Our Holy Gospel this day we read in the eighth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. Then he, meaning Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priest, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciple, he re disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on the divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. <coughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You have in today's gospel one of my favorite forms of learning. You see, when you read this section of scripture, and you need to know that in some of the verses preceding that, just a few verses ahead of the text we read for today, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, you know, who, 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 me, me, he calls, he says, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And then he gets complimented by Jesus. Now, if you read on, you find out that Peter goes from being the star of the class to the dunce of the class, okay? I learn best when I watch other people make mistakes. I don't know about you, but I learn a lot more. They make a lot of them, and so there's a lot to be learned by watching other people. Peter is a great example. He goes from getting the answer right, but missing all the key details. Now, the key detail is that if you look at the title of today's message, No Cross, No Church. You see, it never occurred to Peter in those earlier verses that the Messiah, the Christ, would have to suffer and die. When Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, he was thinking of a miracle worker, a healer, a teacher, a storyteller, wonder worker. But here's the reality. If you do a whole bunch of storytelling, you might make a good library. If you do a whole bunch of teaching, you might make a good school. If you do much, a whole bunch of healing, you might be a hospital. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to bring salvation, to be the church. As Jesus understood the fullness of God's kingdom, you need the cross. No cross, no church. And that still happens today. People can't understand why they're suffering and why Jesus suffered they're thinking that why doesn't he just turn, you know, stones into bread or why doesn't he just cast out all the problems of the world? What needs to happen in our life is we need the cross. And that comes hard for us. We don't think that far ahead. And we're not the only ones. It's not just Peter. I like to look around at history and find other examples of what I'm trying to share with you. I would say one of the great inventors, at least of this nation, maybe in the world, was Henry Ford. Now, you need to know that when Henry Ford built his first car, he didn't put a reverse in it. You see how that might come in handy in some places? Now, that's bad enough, but that wasn't the only thing he missed out on. So he builds the first car, it has no reverse in the transmission, and the doors of the building weren't big enough to get it out once it was finished. In fact, Historians say you can go back to the building and you can see where he had to cut the wall out to get the car out of the room where he built it. That's us. We make those kinds of mistakes. We don't think things all the way through. And that leaves us, if you will, with some scars. First point I just want to share with you, the cross, like any scar that you have on your body, it tells a story, doesn't it? There's one advantage of getting older, we have more scars. They might be surgeries, they might be from accidents, they might be emotional scars. We get scars when we miss things, when we're not as we should be. And the cross is a reminder 
of how fallen the world is. You see, the cross isn't just the place where God sacrificed God's son. The cross reminds us of how fall, far short we fall. If it weren't for sin, and let's don't be pointing fingers at somebody else, if it weren't for our sin, there would be no need for a cross. Now, we'd like to look around, and I know the world is in sad shape, but focus on this as we talk about this passage. If nobody else existed in the world, if nobody else in the world sinned, Jesus would have had to die for each of us on the cross. Not just the really bad people that we could name or point fingers at. If nobody else in the world was alive, the cross would have been necessary just to save each and every one of us. That's sobering. Some years ago, you might be old enough to remember this one. There was a TV character by the name of Steve Urkel in a TV series called Family Matters, and Steve would mess up in major ways. And then he would look at the results of his mistakes, the things he did wrong or didn't do, and he would say, did I do that? Friends, you just finished saying in the confession of sins, I did that. I fell short. I made it necessary for Christ to die on the cross. Peter didn't want to admit that. We don't like to admit that. But the reality is, the cross of Christ is the intersection, if you will, of humans at their worst and God at God's best. Think about the way a cross is designed. The cross reminds us of how bad we can be, how far short we can fall, and of how good and gracious God is. God enters that world so you and I will know forgiveness of sin. And humans fall far short. We fall far, far short. Unless we can get it into our hearts and our minds, I did that. You know, now we'd like to rationalize that and say, well, it's somebody else's fault, or, you know, you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and what did Adam and Eve try? Well, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't. We fell short. It's on us. When you look at the horror of the cross, and it's something that we want to turn our heads away from. I don't know if you remember back a number of years, but uh, Mel Gibson created a movie called The Passion of the Christ. The scenes in that were horrific. The bloodshed, the agony that was depicted. That's what sin causes, and not somebody else's sin. I want to drive this home clearly. It's our sin that brings the necessity of sin the cross and of death. And yet into the midst of that, you see the wonder of God's grace. I would bet many of you love that hymn, Amazing Grace. But grace can't be amazing unless you understand how horrific sin and death and suffering was for Christ. Without the cross, we trivialize grace and forgiveness. But when you see how horrible the cross was for Christ. And you make that connection saying, that should have been you and me on the cross. And instead, Jesus puts himself on the cross. That's grace. That's amazing grace. And that's what's so hard to learn. It took Peter years to learn that. The cross reminds us of how we can be fallen, sinful people. How was it that the world could crucify an innocent person. And then we realize that's how we often live. We don't often intend to do it. It just comes so natural and so easily. And God has to do something about it. God has to dive into that world to redeem us. Even redeem people, transform people like Peter, who can be the most godly of the disciples one moment, and then be accused by Jesus, and I hope you saw that, Jesus has to say to Peter in front of the other disciples, you're working for the devil. Get behind me, Satan. God has to do the same for us. We're no different. But what you need to know also is that the power, the cross has the power, or I should say this, even Peter fell short at the beginning. Think about it. Peter fell short at the beginning. Now, the beginning was pretty long. 
you see, you not only had this dialogue, but then you turn the clock ahead a few uh, weeks, chapters in scripture. You get the same Jesus, uh, the same Peter that said, you are the Christ, the Messiah. Peter tells him, you're working for the devil because you don't understand what it means to be the Christ, the Messiah. And then you find Peter in the courtyard as Jesus is on trial, and three times Jesus, Peter is asked, don't, do you know this man? Peter denies Jesus three times. Why? Because he doesn't want to take up a cross. He doesn't want to suffer for his faith. Now, if it took Peter that long, and Peter's normally considered the chief of disciples, how do we do? How good are we at picking up the cross, making those tough decisions? And when we think about taking up our cross, we're not talking about the things that happen to us. We're talking about the choices we make to align ourselves with Jesus against maybe family, friends, even the world, and saying, I would rather die, meaning take up my cross, than to deny my Lord or play it safe in the world around him. It took Peter a long time to learn that lesson. And it didn't really happen for Peter until he connected the resurrection and the cross. You see, just to take up your cross without absolute confidence in the promised resurrection scares the heck out of us. But once Peter had seen both, when he had seen Jesus on the cross suffering and dying, and then witnessed the resurrected Christ, it was like, okay, now I can do this. We need to connect the resurrection with the cross. And we can. We have evidence in scripture, in the life of Christ, in the body and blood of Christ, that the resurrection is always connected to the cross first for Jesus and then for us. You see, the cross has the power to turn sinners into saints. This cross that the rest of the world wants to shy away from, this cross connected to the resurrection has the power to transform people. It worked for Peter. It can work for us. God can take your and my worst failings and disappointments and transform them into a new way of life. I came across the story I like to think in terms of stories. They're easier to remember than probably most of what I'll share, but they also are quite practical. Years ago, when the economy was different, there were two brothers that were kind of on the wild and reckless, rebellious side, and they found out they could make extra money by stealing the neighbor's sheep and selling them. Well, they finally got caught, and that didn't go so well. The rules then were maybe stricter than we have now, and so rather than kill them, which would have been an option, the village decided that they were going to brand them with two letters on their forehead, the letter S and P, sheep thief. Now just imagine living in a small town and having a permanent scar placed on your forehead that said sheep thief. Well, the run brother couldn't handle it, and he just ran away where nobody knew him and nobody could make the connection and he could lie about what the letters stood for. The other brother decided to stay in town and work at reconciliation. So he made it his lifelong goal to pay back, to undo everything that he had done. So whenever there was an accident, the younger brother with the ST on his forehead, he would come and help out. He would donate time, money, possessions, he would sit with the sick. He would visit the lonely. Any time there was a problem in the community, the younger brother with the letters ST on his forehead would be there lending whatever help he could. Now first the village was quite suspicious of why he was there and thought maybe he was up to something sinister. But years went on and years passed and he just kept up that faithful service. Finally one day a, a visitor came to that village and heard about this young man and heard about all the help that he rendered to people. And then he asked one of the villagers, what does that ST stand for on his forehead? And the villager said, you know, I, I don't know the whole story. I just assumed it stood for saint. How do you turn a sheep thief into a saint? By the grace and power of God. 
connecting the resurrection with the cross. The sin was still there, but now it was forgiven and transformed. You look at really any character in the New Testament, and you will see the transforming power the cross connected to the resurrection brings. I could go through and name other names as well. You see, a Christian life begins with the cross of Christ and leads us to our cross. We come to faith because we st stand in awe and wonder at the cross with Jesus on it, dying in our place. As I mentioned to you, the prelude for this morning was in the cross of Christ I glory. What a contradiction in terms, to glory in the cross? That horrible way of capital punishment? But when that cross where Jesus died brings us transforming power, repentance, a new way of life, then we take up our cross like the brother I told you about in that story and we use it to serve others deliberately, purposefully in a powerful and wonderful way. It starts in the wrong sense, the wrong behavior. And then it gets transformed because we start doing the right thing for the right reason. There are a lot of people that do the right thing but for the wrong reasons. As I was preparing this message, I couldn't help but think back to probably a behavior I witnessed in my own kids and heard a rather unique story about it. So a little kid comes to his mother one day and he complains that his allowance isn't sufficient. And so he gives his mother a bill and he says, you know, for picking up after my younger brother and sister, $5 a week, okay? For helping do dishes every other day, $5 a week. You know, for cleaning up after the dog in the yard, $5 a week. And he goes on and on. He says, you know, for my good report card, $5 a week. So here's a bill for 20 bucks. Well, his mother thinks about it for a while and the next day or two, she gives him a note. And it says, for nine months, carrying you around in my womb, no charge. Okay, for changing thousands of diapers, no charge. Okay, for feeding you thousands of meals, up until this day, no charge. You know, for getting up with you in the middle of the night when you're afraid of monsters or you're not feeling well, no charge. The kid thinks about it and he says, ah, never mind about my bill. You can forget it. When we start comparing what Christ has done for us, especially on the cross, Anything we can do, we don't do out of guilt or obligation. We're just so thankful of how we have been loved. And we only see that when it's connected to the cross. There's no other explanation of God's love for us. You know, we could say, for God so loved us that he was born as a babe in Bethlehem. That's not really the love of God. The love of God that you and I need to know and experience is the cross that changes our whole way of thinking. So from now on, we do the right thing for the right reasons. I just want to remind you of this as we near Holy Week. A cross-eyed life looks different. Now you think about that term, cross-eyed. I'm talking about when you keep the cross of Christ mentally in your mind, you see things differently. God loved me enough to die on the cross for me. I'm a different person. I handle death differently. Because you cannot look at the cross, at least from our vantage point, with Holy Week and Easter coming up, you can't look at the cross and disconnect it from Easter, from the empty tomb. There is power of God even over death and the cross. And we're blessed by that. I don't suppose it's a coincidence. As I was preparing this message, I woke up, I was doing a funeral last Friday, Friday, and I woke up that morning with a Bible verse that came to my mind just out of the blue, Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. I thought I was going to use it at the funeral service that day. And then I got an email from somebody out of my past that said, we thought you should know 
that your friend Doug died today. Now, Doug was the man who I had as a Sunday school teacher and a youth sponsor when I was in high school. He lost his wife while I was in high school. And I was so impressed by how he handled her death way premature and how I could see in him and sense in him the power that he believed in the resurrection. And he could go on living his life. He was back teaching my Sunday school class that Sunday. I have no doubt that I went into the ministry because of Doug. And so here I am thinking about the power of the cross, the power of the resurrection, and put them together. And I realized that's who changed my life. When that happens in your life, now you're ready to live. They've done studies, and they found that people who live a life of self-denial, of putting Christ at the center of their life, and these are some things you might be interested in. They're happier, their families are stronger, they're more tolerant, and they're more community-minded. Those are all things that were evidenced in the one brother that I told you about in the story of the sheep thief. You see it in Peter. He eventually does get transformed and senses both the power of the cross and the wonder of the resurrection. And then we connect that with that story, if you will. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecutors for they will inherit the kingdom. That's the power of the cross connected with the resurrection. Let me close with putting this in picture form. What you'll see on the screen is like eight slides of somebody carrying a cross. And if you could read along, and I know the print is real small, but if you look along the top, he basically complains to God, God, couldn't you make the cross a little easier, a little lighter? And so you'll see him cut off a piece of it. And then if you watch the, the bottom, what would be my left-hand corner, now he's moving along, it's lighter, it's easier. Only then you come to the end of the line and everybody else who's carried the cross, they can put it across the chasm that we might call death. But because he shortened his cross, it doesn't work. There's a reason Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Yes, it's heavy. Yes, it's burdensome. It's probably even painful. But with a cross connected to the resurrection is truly amazing grace. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for the saints who have gone before us. But especially we thank you for the life of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross that we might live Lord, show us how to be so filled with thanks and praise that we take up our cross and be a blessing to others. And I pray this in your name. Amen.